for joining today's educational webinar with Cancer Support Community Los Angeles. I'm Abby Espinosa, the program coordinator at CSELA, and I'm honored to welcome you to this week's webinar titled Optimizing Menopause Nutrition for Breast Cancer Thrivers. Before we begin, if this is your first time joining us, Cancer Support Community Los Angeles is a premier nonprofit organization providing vital social and emotional support to families facing cancer, including patients, caregivers, and their loved ones, all at no cost. Our programs include support groups, healthy lifestyle classes, social activities, and educational programs such as this one. If you would like to learn more about our services or watch past webinars, please visit our website at cancersupportla.org. Before I introduce today's speaker, please note that your video and microphone are automatically disabled for this webinar. You may, however, enter your questions into the Q&A feature found at the bottom of the Zoom window at any time. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. We may not be able to get to all your questions today, but we'll get to as many as possible. And to introduce today's speaker, Tamar Rothenberg is a registered dietitian nutritionist who specializes in nutrition for breast and ovarian cancer thrivers in her private practice in Los Angeles. She studied intuitive eating and has certificates in both vegetarian nutrition and herbal formulations in cancer care. Tamar's certificate in herbal formulations in cancer care is from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. She co-facilitated a group at Cancer Support Community, Community Los Angeles for the study, Coping with Cancer in the Kitchen, a nutrition education program for cancer survivors which was published in the journal Nutrients in 2020. Tamar is also the author of a new book, Cancer Diet for the Newly Diagnosed, an integrative guide and cookbook for treatment and recovery. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome today's speaker, Tamar Rothenberg. Hi, everyone. Thank you, Abby. So great to be back. I'm just going to share my slides here. And... Uh... Let's get this set up. Okay. And I'll just, let's, let's get started here and let me do this. How's that, good? Okay, great. So I have a special connection with Cancer Support Community of LA, so I'm really thrilled to be back. So uh, we're talking today about optimizing menopause nutrition for breast cancer thrivers. And if you're here, you're probably struggling with menopause side effects. And I want to point out that it's different for everyone. So maybe your friend sailed through menopause but while you're using three fans and it's still not helping. So keep that in mind. What works for one person may not work for another and we're all different. So don't minimize your side effects. Uh, we'll start, I wanna stay a little positive. I'll tell you why, because I'll be going over some um, chronic diseases that um, happen during or more at risk for during menopause. So we want to keep things a little positive. And then I'll go into what happens in menopause and why. The specific nutrients to support optimal health during menopause. And of course, I can't do a presentation without a recipe. So we'll have a culinary video. And I will leave time for a Q&A. I know you probably have lots of questions, um, but if you need me to clarify something during the presentation or you didn't hear me, just um, write it up in the, the chat and I will repeat it again. So here's a quote from Angelina Jolie, who we know is the famous previvor. Um, because her, she was diagnosed with uh, BRCA1, I believe, and her mother had ovarian cancer. So she said, every woman is different when they go through menopause. And I didn't know how emotionally how I would feel. So I think we can really relate to that quote. And I want to start actually with the conclusion. We have lots of good research that a nutritious diet along with exercise can help alleviate perimenopausal and menopausal symptoms 
and prevent numerous chronic conditions, including cardiovascular or heart disease, diabetes, and various types of cancer. Of course, when we talk about prevent, we're not necessarily talking about prevention, we're talking about reducing your risk of uh, either cancer or chronic diseases. Um, and I also want to add, I'll be talking a lot about nutrition and maybe supplements, but I want to add that taking medications is not a failure. They may indeed complement other changes that you're doing. And I know there are many uh, women after breast cancer that really don't really want to take medications after going through active treatment and so many surgeries but uh, they may really work for, uh, for you. So don't see it as something that is, you're doing something wrong or it's a failure. So when I think of keeping things positive, I, of course I think about Betty White um, who said, I may be a senior, but so what? At least I'm hot. And um, actually someone pointed out to me, it could be that she, she had hot flashes, but I think it's still very funny. And uh, notice the size of the glass, that is not necessarily recommended for thrivers, but it's funny nonetheless. And then Ellen, what did she say? Why do they say we're over the hill? I don't even know what that means and why it's a bad thing. When I go hiking and I get over the hill, that means I'm past the hard part and there's a snack in my future. So as a dietitian, I agree with that. So um, probably you know this already, I'll just uh, briefly go into an introduction to menopause, that menopause occurs when the ovaries stop producing estrogen. And this could be a natural menopause or a sudden menopause. And the hormone involved in sexual reproductive development is estrogen, in addition to many other functions that we'll go over. But just so you know, 75 to 80% of women suffer from menopausal symptoms. So uh, you're not alone. And it's actually more severe in 20 to 30% of women. So uh, we shouldn't discount this, uh, really let your medical team know because you're not the only one that, that may be suffering from these symptoms. Um, the average onset of menopause, sorry, is 45 to 55 years of age. And of course that's only a range, could be younger or older. So, um, in perimenopause, which is the time leading up to menopause, this is when your body gets adjusted to um, having less estrogen because the ovaries are beginning to produce less estrogen. I probably don't need to tell you about these symptoms, you know this, but the common symptoms are menstrual cycle changes, there's hot flashes and night sweats, which, which can be very disturbing. Uh, sleep disturbances, vaginal dryness, urinary tract changes. Many women developed uh, urinary tract infections. Weight gain, especially around the midsection. Uh, this distresses a lot of my clients, but it's really a natural phase. And then changes in mood, which I've heard termed menorrhage. I don't quite agree with that, but so um, if you wanna put in the chat, if I missed any, I do have another slide, but I'd love to hear if there are any others that, any other symptoms that you've experienced while I keep going here. So um, when we go into sudden menopause, which is usually caused by either surgical menopause, it could be an oophorectomy, it could be a hysterectomy, um, or it could be chemical, meaning hormonal therapy. So these are much more disruptive. Um, sorry. The common symptoms are, again, weight gain may be more pronounced, especially on the hormonal therapies, the hormone blockers. Um, bone pain is worse. There's disrupted sleep, meaning the quality of sleep is not as good. 
Hot flashes are more persistent. Thirst signals decline. Now, many people feel, um, many people understand that elderly people may have their thirst signals decline, but it actually starts happening after menopause. And of course, hair loss. So body size changes. Let's go into some of the reasons for some of these changes that may help you um, with the side effects to know there are reasons behind it. So body size changes. Why am I gaining weight? Well, it's a very natural process, even though we don't like it. The body needs more estrogen and it's looking to get it from anywhere. Where do we find estrogen? It's in our, what we call adipose cells, our fat cells. So the body tends to store these fat cells, especially around the midsection, which is kind of the easiest place to grab this estrogen. And then estradiol, estradiol is actually, when we talk about estrogen, it's actually a group of hormones that includes uh, estradiol, estrone, and estriol. So estrogen is really just a general term, but estradiol is a hormone with strong metabolic effects. So estrogen by itself has a hunger suppressing effect. So if you're feeling hungrier, there's a reason for it. And um, the lack of estrogen also induces you to be more sedentary because your body's kind of getting ready to settling down. But of course, we're not ready, right? So here's some solutions. And of course, there are more. And if I'd love you to um, include in the chat if you found other things that work for you. Number one is if you can work with a physical therapist so you feel safe doing uh, more exercise without uh, more joint pain, um, find enjoyable activity. This needs to be something you're gonna do every day that you enjoy. It doesn't have to be what we call exercise or something boring to you. It could be dancing at home, you know, whatever you like. Um, sleep hygiene, which I'll go into more. Sleep hygiene is just um, kind of cleaning up your sleep environment so you sleep better. You may need to check your thyroid levels. They do tend to change. Uh, and then uh, many women try these extreme diets or eating less to see if they can uh, lose some of that weight. But just know that diets less than 1200 calories, there is a higher risk of nutrient deficiencies and what we call relapse. Relapse is when you gain the weight back and you usually gain even more. So I know a lot of the apps I see, their default is 1200 calories. And uh, it's a little crazy because it's not meant for um, most of the population. And also, if you do have a lack of quality of sleep, um, your body tends to reach for um, the quick energy, which is carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates. So notice if that's happening to you and that may impact your uh, body size as well. So bone pain, have many of you experienced bone pain? Um, why do my joints hurt? This especially is uh, worsened with the hormonal therapies uh, for breast cancer. So why do my joints hurt? Well, it turns out that estrogen actually lines uh, the joint, it's a part of our cartilage around our joints. So it's protective. And when that's gone, we do feel more joint pain. Also, of course, the aromatase inhibitors, that's a common side effect that it causes more bone pain. And again, it makes sense that this pain leads us to being more sedentary. So again, some solutions work with a physical therapist so you feel you can work safely. Um, try anti-inflammatory foods. Uh, these are more you know, whole foods that can reduce some inflammation in the body. Uh, some people have found effective acupuncture works for them, even massage. 
again, finding enjoyable activity. And then uh, there was one study that it does need to be replicated, but it was interesting that a certain combination of curcumin, which is the active ingredient in turmeric, um, really helped with joint pain among women who had experienced uh, breast cancer. And what they did was they did a study using a combination of curcumin, omega-3, which is a fish oil, and something called hydroxytyrosol, which is a potent antioxidant, and it's actually derived from an olive tree leaf. Um, this is something you'll need to discuss with your medical team and your dietitian um, because it, it's, you know, it just showed in one study. It doesn't mean it'll work for everyone, but um, we have to also see that it doesn't interact. But um, the olive tree leaf is pretty, it's harmless really. And it seems to work in combination with these things. So something to consider. And then of course, medications. There are medications that do work for bone pain and definitely something you should bring up with your medical team. Sleep quality, why am I not getting enough sleep, right? That eludes many people. So of course, hormonal changes, uh, hot flashes will definitely disrupt sleep. Uh, irregular unbalanced meals. Uh, so what happens when you're not um, eating regularly, you have more hot flashes when your blood sugar goes down. So if you're feeling, you know, you're having uh, more hot flashes, you need to eat a little more regularly. Um, and then vitamin deficiencies, that could be um, a, a reason. Uh, there's something just to check in your next labs. And then uh, many people don't realize that melatonin, which is, we call that the sleep hormone, the production of melatonin actually declines after age 40. So melatonin is synthesized from another hormone called tryptophan, and that declines in later ages. So what are some uh, ways we can uh, deal with all this? Uh, adding more omega-3 foods that releases, omega-3 actually releases uh, serotonin, which is a calming hormone, so that may help. Um, avoiding these blood sugar spikes, which is uh, irregular eating. Um, and also irregular eating disrupts the, uh, what we call the biorhythm, which causes a shift in the sleep cycle and actually lowers the quality of sleep. So try not to miss meals or eat, you know, small meals. Um, also, if we do experience vitamin deficiencies, so vitamins and trace elements are necessary to produce melatonin. So these include things like folic acids, vitamin B6, B12, magnesium, and zinc. So basically, if you're getting enough um, a variety in your foods, you should be able to cover these vitamins, but that's another good reason to eat regularly and to eat a good variety of foods. Um, an important aspect is getting more daylight during the day and less nightlight. So what that does is it regulates the melatonin. So um, it stores it during the day and releases it at night, and that can really help with sleep. Uh, no alcohol, or at least no alcohol in the evening, it does not help with sleep. Uh, stopping caffeine after the noon. It does take about eight hours to wear off, so a good reason to stop. And then um, try some high melatonin foods. These are foods with the greatest amount of melatonin, and they're also uh, extremely nutritious. So try nuts. Uh, cherries are particularly good. Uh, grape skin. So the, you can eat the whole grape. I'm not saying don't, but the melatonin is actually in the grape skin. Um, and strawberries. So what's wrong with those foods, right? And then uh, either take a cold shower or a hot bath. See what works for you because that affects your core temperature, which may help with sleep.
Anything else? Can you uh, think of anything else that really helped you? Oh, I see some Q and A's. Oh, okay. Oh, is my photo blocking the slide? Because I see here a Q and A. Uh, I, I'll move it up anyway. Uh, if you're on your phone, it may block the slide. All right, so hot flashes. Um, I do have two slides because there's many reasons for these hot flashes. Why am I experiencing more hot flashes? Of course, the hormonal changes are to blame. We know that. But they are more persistent and stronger with aromatase inhibitors and sudden menopause. So for example, on tamoxifen, the average women will have at least six hot flashes a day. And that can be very disruptive, right? So if we're not getting enough sleep and we're experiencing night sweats, that affects our focus and our productivity. Um, and so this is not something to be minimized. It's really uh, can be disruptive. And um, along with that, the our temperature is regulated by something called the hypothalamus. And the way it works is the mechanism to dissipate heat after menopause is actually lowered. So you are feeling hotter, you are feeling a different temperature, or you may feel colder even. Um, so it's true that we are feeling more temperature changes. And then some solutions, actually many of these my clients have suggested. So there's something called a chillo, which is a chilled pillow. Um, fans by your bed can be helpful. Um, another client alerted me, which I didn't know, is something called a cooling weighted blanket. So usually weighted blankets are too hot, but this is one that's a cooling and it's actually very pretty. It looks like a knitted blanket. So something to try. Uh, of course, avoid alcohol and other triggers. So Triggers may be different for you than other people. For some people, it's spicy food. Um, you may be able to tolerate spicy food. So figure out what your triggers are. Um, but there's been quite a few studies that stress worsens hot flashes and night sweats. And these studies were done in breast cancer survivors. In fact, um, uh, younger women uh, experience more hot flashes uh, than older women. So the, uh, some of it is due to, of course, the anxiety and stress of a breast cancer diagnosis. So seek uh, more support if you want and uh, mindfulness techniques, uh, quieting your mind. Uh, these all may work for you. As I said, don't skip meals. So your blood sugar stays steady. And uh, HRT, so there's new thinking about hormone replacement therapy. It's a good conversation to have with your doctor. So we used to say it was a no for everyone. Um, now there's new thinking about it, but um, your you know, situation may be unique and you have to discuss whether it's safe for you um, after breast cancer. I'm just looking at the Q&A here. Oh, green tea stopped my hot flashes. That's wonderful. That's good news. Okay. Um, okay. So here's another slide. Hot flashes continued. I have another chat here. Let's see. I'm going to move this to the side. Oh. Okay. Um, I think in my research, I found this very interesting that ethnicity and genetics um, can affect uh, how we experience hot flashes. Um, so black women report more frequent hot flashes than white women and Japanese and Chinese women report less. Now that's very interesting also because uh, Asian women eat a lot more so soy foods, which tends to lower hot flashes. So I don't know if that's the reason or that's, uh, you know, of course, uh, ethnicity. 
but um, also genetics. So it turns out uh, you're, there are genetic uh, variations that can affect um, the number and the strength of the hot flashes you have. Um, the average number of years that women experience hot flashes is four and a half years. That is quite a long time, right? Um, and then a third of a woman experience moderate, severe hot flashes. It could be a decade. Um, another thing to note is that the most common uh, symptom of hot flashes happens in the first four hours of sleep. So if we can figure out a way to fall asleep, stay asleep during those first few hours, that's gonna be very helpful. So what are some solutions for some of these hot flashes? Hydration surprisingly is very helpful. I will go into that in the next slide. And then uh, medications like antidepressants, SSRIs, your doctor um, can prescribe ones that don't interact with the other hormonal therapies that you're on. Um, something called CBT, which is a therapy that seems to work pretty well. Um, yes, dietary soy, which is soy foods are safe for breast cancer survivors, but we're not talking about supplements. Those haven't been studied, so we don't recommend taking them. But uh, soy foods are a great source of protein and also um, seem to improve hot flashes, but you'd have to eat a lot more than you think. That's what um, women in Asia eat a lot more than Americans. And then finally, I want to pre preface this that not everything works for everyone. And, um, you know, it may be this worked for your friend, but it didn't work for you. So the North America Menopause Society does not recommend supplements, herbal remedies, or acupuncture for relief. They don't stand behind them because there's no evidence that those work. Um, but, you know, maybe there's some you tried that do work for you, like someone just said green tea. So uh, it's important to experiment it with safe um, herbs or things that may work for you. Um, so hydration. Some menopausal symptoms are actually improved by proper hydration. And I know my a lot of my clients are walking around quite dehydrated um, and don't realize it. We just forget to drink during the day. And it's especially now when it's hot, important. So what? why is it so important? Adequate daily fluid intake actually helps transport nutrients throughout our body. It helps transport oxygen, which gives us more energy. And it improves our, our gut health. So that's really important. And then the hormones estrogen and progesterone actually affect fluid and electrolyte balance and thirst signals. So once they decline, just like I said, our thirst signals are going to decline as well. So it's important to keep it up. Uh, maybe share, is there any kind of drink that you enjoy that you are drinking more of? Um, for example, mocktails are fun, maybe an infused water with some fruit or herbs. And especially now with the great summer fruits, maybe try some hydrating foods, um, melons, grapes, cucumbers, all the stone fruits. And then uh, try maybe a timer or app if you want. There are so many now. Uh, free ones that you could try. Has anyone here used a timer or an app for hydration? Anyone uh, that found that it works for them? Uh, I'd love to hear more. So let's go into more of the health risks for what happens after our uh, hormonal drops. They do increase our health risks. Why is that? So estrogen is very protective. We know that. So we now have 
decreased protection against heart-related conditions, we have accelerated bone loss, and blood sugar may rise, along with cholesterol as well. So really, a holistic approach to the care of healthy menopause includes changes in the diet. And then um, also the aromatase inhibitors, some of them raise cholesterol. Um, also with uh, an interesting fact is that with the drop in estrogen, there's an increased secretion of inflammatory compounds. So kind of your body is maybe going through a low grade systemic inflammation. And that's where a lot of the anti-inflammatory foods can play a role um, and also help with high blood pressure. And then uh, while we have estrogen, our insulin resistance is usually improved and in what we call insulin sensitivity. So we don't have the blood sugar spikes, but that is, you know, less protective without um, estrogen. So our blood sugar may rise. Uh, is there a question here? Let me just see. Oh, okay. I'll, thank you for your questions. I'll answer the, that and end. Those are good questions. Um, so compounded by other risk factors that are common during this time, women are at a higher risk for heart disease, um, type 2 diabetes, and osteoporosis. So keep up with your screening and your monitoring. It's very important to um, nip these in the bud when we catch them and either work with more dietary changes or and or medications. Um, so this slide has a lot of information. Let me go over it. This is kind of a menu for nutrients for menopause. And these are the things we want to focus on. These are nutrients that support our overall health before, during, and after menopause. So if you see in the box, the nutrients that are most uh, of concern are of course going to be calcium for your bones, uh, along with vitamin D, C for inflammation and healing, B for metabolism, and the omega-3 fatty acids like we talked about may help also with um, reducing inflammation. So and then from the list on the left, we want to choose at least three, four portions daily of vegetables and fruit, two, one to two portions daily. Um, some people think that fruit has too much sugar. They shouldn't be having it. This is not true. It's a whole package that's filled with nutrients and they're also delicious right now. Whole grains, you may want to include more whole grains because you want to reach at least 30 to 45 grams of fiber daily. This is extremely important for uh, gut health, which helps with our hormonal health. And then nuts and seeds, you want to have at least one ounce of unsalted or nuts or seeds daily. And again, I find people are afraid to have them because of calories. But actually one ounce, even though it doesn't sound like a lot, it's really a lot. So one ounce of uh, almonds is 23 almonds. I mean, that's a lot, right? And then uh, it's 14 halves of walnuts. Guess how many pistachios? Put it in the chat. How many pistachios do you think is one ounce in the q and A? I I mean? And then... Uh, it's 42 peanuts. Uh, let's see what, oops, sorry. This is very, so let's see what some of you guessed here. Um, uh, 36, very close. So it's actually 49 pistachios. I mean, that's a lot, right? If you sat there and had uh, 49 pistachios, you'd be quite full. So um, enjoy your nuts. One ounce is perfectly fine a day. Uh, finally, even though I had this big list here, just choose one thing and go with it. Choose one change out of this list 
uh, not all at once so that you can see how it feels to you, your, to your body and um, feel a sense of accomplishment and then go on to the next. So uh, when we work on changing our health behaviors, we really just want to set small goals. So that would mean just taking one from that list of foods I put on. Uh, focus on one behavior. Is it going to be dietary? Is it going to be exercise? Is it going to be stress release? These are all great behaviors to try to work on. Consider your motivation and purpose. Is it to sleep better? Is it quality of life? You know, all those are great reasons. Um, accept the process. It may be not as fast as you want, but that's okay. Uh, seek support if you need it, more support or uh, support groups. Cancer Support LA has wonderful groups. And really enjoy the journey. Don't make it like a chore. Oh, I have to eat more vegetables. Just find new vegetables maybe in the farmer's market that you enjoy and things like that. Okay. So again, generally uh, nutrition for menopause, on average, the transition is seven years. So we have to enjoy it. We, we don't have a choice. Seven years is a long time, right? unless it's sudden menopause, and that's going to be very quick, but not as pleasant. Um, so we want to prioritize, try to plan meals with mostly non-starchy veggies, protein, and whole grains. Set those goals, even right now, if you want to write down one goal from that list that we went over. Uh, give yourself permission to enjoy fun foods, because if you don't, you're either going to binge on those foods or you'll feel very restricted and deprived and the, your changes will not be sustainable. Try to work on uh, those strategies for getting adequate sleep. And then limit or avoid extreme diets like we talked about or even extreme exercise that you can't sustain or that might cause pain. Uh, choose mostly unsweetened beverages. We don't have to eliminate all desserts, things like that. But the largest amount of sugar in the American diet is from beverages. So if you just do that one change, you're really reducing a lot of sugar. And then avoid or limit alcohol. There are many different opinions for breast cancer thrivers about alcohol. But we do know that every glass raises your risk. So it's your comfort level, whatever you're comfortable with. And finally, just to give you a whole picture, I know there's a lot here, but this is what we call a menopause supporting plate. As you see, it's very colorful. We have healthy fats like olive oil, grapeseed oil, walnut or avocado oil. And those are, some of those are very high temperature oils. So they're great for stir fries, things like that. Um, a variety of vegetables. These are both uh, starchy, non-starchy. Find the ones you enjoy. Add in a little every day. Uh, your fruits, colorful fruits. And then uh, try water, green or black tea, and unsweetened beverages. And as we talked about, we have a great variety of whole grains, seeds, and nuts. Um, so among these, uh, walnuts have omega-3s, and they also have protein. Um, and then uh, flax meal is recommended for breast cancer drivers, along with soy. Just make sure it's ground, not whole. Um, but a grains like barley, brown rice, those are all great options. And then for your protein, uh, choose from wild salmon, any fatty fish, uh, beans, of course, eggs, chicken, soy foods, and yogurt. These are all good options for you. And if you're vegan or vegetarian, you can get enough protein through your diet, don't be afraid that you're missing out. So this is kind of a worksheet I do with my clients uh, for easier shopping and meal planning. We're gonna choose some of these uh, nutritious items for menopause. Maybe you'll choose like uh, six vegetables for the week, 
uh, a couple of starches, some fruits that are in season, that would be nice. Uh, your proteins, which can vary every week. That might be this week, soy, salmon, or tempeh, whatever you enjoy. Your fats, so that could be olive oil, or it could be avocado or walnuts. And then always include your seasonings or a blend of seasonings that you enjoy here. I have a cilantro lime dressing and maybe a taco blend. And once you have those, you can start um, including the recipes uh, that you want for the week. Um, that could be like pumpkin chili, avocado lime salmon, uh, mini pumpkin muffins, uh, cardamom orange overnight oats, or a beauty green smoothie with kiwi. Um, and of course, you're going to have convenience items in your pantry. Um, those are really easy to have on hand, like canned salmon or in the freezer, frozen cauliflower rice, maybe some almond flour crackers. So uh, when you're, this makes planning a little easier and uh, reduces a lot of the decision fatigue we have when we're planning meals. So let's get cooking. Here's a recipe I chose. Um, this is a chilled zucchini basil soup, which is nice this time of year because it is hot. Um, these are very accessible ingredients. Really, it's just zucchini, onion, a cup of basil, some lemon zest. So lemon zest has the antioxidants um, in the peel more than inside the lemon. Uh, some olive oil and your favorite vegetable broth, some yogurt, Greek yogurt for more protein, and then of course, salt and pepper. And uh, this has an easy prep time. You just need to chill it. So you may want to do it, you know, earlier in the day. And, uh, and then you puree it. But this is a, a wonderful recipe. Also, if you're experiencing um, uh, if you're in medical treatment and cold foods taste better, this is a nice thing to add. So I'm going to show the video now. Uh, okay, so it's a chilled zucchini basil soup. These are your basic ingredients, really easy to find. I included the chopping so you can take a look. You really just need to chop this coarsely because you're going to pure puree this anyway. This is a nice way to slice the onion if you want to take a look here. This also is a, a budget friendly recipe because you're really just using zucchini, onion. If you grow basil, then really easy to add here a cup of basil. Uh, now you're heating up your olive oil. You're just adding in your zucchini and onion and garlic. And you're only going to saute this for a short time. So it's still kind of fresh. The vegetable broth, you're only simmering for five minutes. Um, I use a hand blender and then you don't need to uh, wait for it to be cooled, but you can use a blender. And then you add the rest of your ingredients, your Greek yogurt, lemon zest. Um, keep some basil aside for uh, the topping. And there it is. Doesn't that look good? How does that sound? Do you think you'll make it? Okay. All right. So uh, this is my new book. You can find it wherever books are sold. It's called Cancer Diet for the Newly Diagnosed. It also has about 70 recipes in it. Uh, sorry, I'm seeing a lot of questions. So let's see what's happening here. Love it. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Um, and then let's connect, please. You can, uh, I have a website, Tamar Rothenberg RD. Um, 
my email is nutritionnomnom at gmail. I am on Instagram as breast cancer nutritionist. And you can also join, I have a private group on Facebook for nutrition um, called A Fresh Start for Breast Cancer Thrivers. So thank you very much. Uh, I am looking forward to your questions here. Thank you, Tamar, for your meaningful presentation. I know we all learned a lot, and I feel like I'm hungry now after seeing that recipe. I know. I feel bad. It's lunchtime. <laughs> no, it's okay. Hopefully, we all try the recipe, but we can go ahead and get started with these questions. Um, so someone asked, what do you recommend for hot flashes, and if there are any natural, you know, recommendation? Um it's going to be very individual, right? So natural, like somebody had said, green tea helped her. Uh, soy foods can be helpful. As I said, the North American Menopause Society doesn't recommend um, because there's no evidence behind uh, a lot of the things like uh, black cohosh is actually not recommended for breast cancer. Or it can be estrogenic. Uh, flaxseed, even though it's touted as helpful, we haven't seen in the studies that it's helpful. Um, so uh, really, it's a lot of uh, lifestyle stra strategies, along with um, certain foods and medications. Perfect. Thank you. I know there are some on the market. I'm not sure. Uh, there are some that my clients have said have helped them. But again, it's going to be very individual. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then someone just asked the general questions. What are a few anti-inflammatory foods? Yeah, great question. So those are, um, you know, think of more whole foods. Um, so let's say you have an orange from the tree, right? So that's a whole food. That's going to be an anti-inflammatory food. And then let's say you make orange juice. That's still a whole food, but less not so much an anti-inflammatory food as much as the orange. And then you have orange candy, right? So that's the processed food that actually increases inflammation. So think along uh, more of the, uh, your fruits and vegetables, plant foods are always gonna be anti-inflammatory and some have more or less compounds. Great, thank you. And then someone asked for vegetarians, what is an alternative to fish? Also, can we have five servings of fruit a day um, or is that too much sugar? <laughs> um, it's not a question. It, I mean, yes, it could be a question of sugar. It's just, I find that people are putting too much fruit in their smoothies. So they are having more fruit than recommended. Um, if you uh, keep it to two, you know, or three servings a day, I think five, I don't know your lifestyle. I don't know about what you're eating apart from that. But um, it, it sounds like it may be a little too much, but if you're um, enjoying it, uh, depending on what the other foods you're having, it may be okay. So I can't give you a blanket statement like, wow, that's too much. You shouldn't be having that. So <laughs> uh, what was the second part of the question? The and, and then the first part was just for vegetarians, what is an alternative oh. to fish? And then if they are vegetarian, can they take omega-3 supplements? Um, it depends. I don't know what else you're having as usual, but, um, you can find omega threes in lots of seeds, uh, nuts. Um, I do recommend for, if you're vegan, certainly to take an omega three supplement, but, uh, for vegetarians, not necessarily it depends what, you know, what your eating looks like and, uh, a, gr a great protein. In, so instead of fish, if you want the omega threes, yes, it would be nuts and seeds and things like that. Um, or you may need a supplement. Um, so those would be the, you know, kind of the proteins. There are other great vegetarian proteins. They don't necessarily have omega-3s. Um, yeah, that's what I can think of right now. Perfect. Thank you. And then someone asked, what grains would you suggest for an individual with celiac? Fiber intake can be difficult. Yeah, very difficult. Um, well, of course you're going to want to go gluten-free. So, uh, you can try buckwheat is gluten-free, has a lot of good minerals, um, gluten-free oatmeal. Um, I'm trying to think of the list that I haven't had, but 
um rice is fine so those are three grains right there that would be fine perfect thank you um and then someone asked can a birth control pill be used as a form of hormone replacement if it contains some estrogen yeah that's really a question for your doctor if uh uh, which ones you're, or I don't know if you've been through breast cancer, is this from a breast cancer survivor? That's something, so that's really uh, an MD question. So I couldn't answer it. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then someone said that they noticed dairy is not in the food charts. Is it something that is not recommended? Oh, no, I did have yogurt. So yogurt is absolutely recommended. It's a great protein. It's cultured. Uh, filled with good cultures. Um, so that is recommended. It's not like you need to avoid all dairy, but cheese is, you know, very high in saturated fat, which is not a great thing. Um, milk, uh, you don't need it after the age of two. And we have so many great plant-based options. So I wouldn't unnecessarily say you need to have milk for calcium. There are other foods for that. Perfect. And then someone just had a random question. They asked, why don't we get hot flashes before puberty when we also had lower estrogen levels? That's a really good question. <laughs> I think because the, you're not developed hormonally, so it wouldn't make sense to have uh, a sudden uh, reaction from a lack of estrogen. So, uh, but that's a great question for an endocrinologist. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, and then someone asked, does it matter what kind of breast cancer you have or what treatment plan you are on, you are on regarding what kind of foods to eat slash avoid? Um, well, there are certain foods that recommended for different types of breast cancer, but um, in terms of avoiding foods, um, there's certain foods that help better with the estrogen you know, hormonal cancers, HR positive, um, that wouldn't necessarily help as much for uh, the other types of cancers. So, and there are certain foods that help along that are more helpful if you're on um, the, the newer treatments for immunotherapy. So yes, it, it can be very different. It's more about, um, it's not like some foods are dangerous for any type of breast cancer. It's more about certain foods are more beneficial mm -hmm. for a certain type of breast cancer. Yes, it's a good question. Thank you. Um, and then just to follow up, other than alcohol or processed meats, are there any other things to avoid? Um, well, there's individual things that, you know, for people who have IBS or celiac, of course, allergies, these are things you're going to be avoiding. In general, for breast cancer, um, what we do see is that, yes, alcohol, that is the top of the list, and um, processed meats are going to be most harmful in terms of raising your risk. There are other foods that we see minor risks with, like, um, it's, you know, it's a question of your diet quality, not necessarily one food or other. What's your, what are you eating every day? What's your dietary pattern? Um, is it generally positive and generally nutritious? Are you getting a good variety? Are you getting high fiber? Things like that. Um, those are going to be the most beneficial. Instead of thinking about what should I cut out, think about what can I add in to um, optimize my health? So that, that's kind of the thinking I encourage. Great. Thank you. Um, and someone asked, is soy safe for all types of breast cancer when initially diagnosed and throughout treatment? Yes. So soy is absolutely recommended now. Soy foods, not supplements. Um, and actually now we know from the research, we shouldn't be, we should be encouraging it starting in adolescence. That seems to be the most helpful in reducing the risk of breast cancer. So just from that, we know it's extremely helpful. So there's no limit. Have as much as you want. Tofu, tempeh, edamame, soy milk. These are all great options. So unless you're allergic or have a sensitivity to soy, a uh, great protein, uh, vegetarian protein option as well. 
you know, maybe try a meatless uh, meal once in a while with just soy, see how that feels. Great, thank you. And then we have time for one last question and this is a two part question. So this is coming from a breast cancer survivor. They are asking if you can eat fish daily. If you can eat fish daily? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So it depends on the type of fish. I would encourage, you know, fatty fish, um, you know, like salmon, the lower lower mercury fish, um, specific types of tuna. So um, I don't see any uh, health risks with that as long as you're having the lower mercury options. Uh, my suggestion always is to follow these suggestions for uh, specific suggestions type of fish for pregnant women. Those would be also applicable for breast cancer survivors. Great. And then just the second part to their question, is it good to take a probiotic vitamin daily? Yeah, that's such a great question because um, people don't understand that probiotics have different strains. They, you have to have the right amount it has to heal a certain condition. It's not for general GI health. It won't do anything like that. Um, so yes, from food, it's always great. Make sure it has enough, uh, like sauerkraut, you know, has great probiotics. But if you're taking a supplement, it has to be for a certain condition, like IBS or constipation. It's not like one strain will uh, will cure everything. So it's important to get advice on that. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tamar. That's unfortunately all the time we have for questions. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. I know we thank all you. learned a thank lot. Thank you for the great questions. <laughs> you always, always get me thinking. <laughs> um, thank you so much. Um, and then we are going to share one final slide. Um, so I can go ahead and pull those up. Okay, so if you all would like to learn more about Cancer Support Community Los Angeles, please feel free to visit our website at cancersupportla.org. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to email us at info at cancersupportla.org. We would also like to let you all know about one of our support groups that we currently offer. Um, we have a metastatic breast cancer support group that meets on Tuesdays from 5 to 7 p.m. or on Thursdays from 3 to 5 p.m. Um, if you would like to learn more about how to get started with this group, please feel free to email us, or you can also get started by scanning that QR code on the bottom right corner. Um, and I want to thank our participants once again for joining us and for all of your thoughtful questions. Um, we really appreciate you coming to these, and we hope to see you at the next one. And thank you once again to Mar for being here and for sharing your time with us. Um, we truly appreciate it. I hope you all have a great rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Have a great weekend. Bye-bye.